Uh, our next speaker is Adina Roskies from Dartmouth College, and she'll be speaking on predictive coding and cognitive ontology. Thanks. Um, thanks to Mike and everyone at the Rotman for inviting me to do this. Uh, I was looking at the um, workshop schedule the other day and I was thinking, thank goodness there are only about 10 people at this meeting. It's going to be really small and I can try something new and, uh, <laughs> and un sort of things that, that I haven't really formulated my thoughts clearly enough about. So then I showed up this morning and uh, so just like I'm supposed to imagine you all in your underwear, I'm going to imagine there are only 10 of you out there and give the talk that I was going to give to the 10. Um, so what I want to talk about today uh, is the, what I'll call the classical view of neural function, which will be very familiar to anyone who's taken a basic neuroscience course. Um, then I'm going to talk about predictive coding, which may not be new to some of you. Um, hopefully it's new to, to some people, though. And I, it's a, a relatively new and I think very exciting theory about what the brain is doing that, uh, that explains a lot of data, um, maybe not everything, and that's uh, still to be, to be determined. Um, and then uh, ask the question of what implications predictive coding has, if any, uh, for thinking about uh, cognitive ontology or, or the taxonomy of psychology. So Mike's introduction this morning made me realize that I can't take for granted that those things are the same thing. I'm going to really talk about uh, the cognitive ontology or the sorts of um, ontolo ontological elements that we think of as uh, forming the basis of cognition if we're trying to understand what is the brain doing when we um, do cognitive tasks. Uh, but I, I think after hearing Mike's introduction, the taxonomy of psychology is much broader than that, and I'm not going to be talking about that. And I'm also going to take for granted the maybe contentious question of what the brain should be telling us. I mean, I think it would be interesting for discussion whether, uh, even if you're convinced that, the, that predictive coding theory has certain kinds of implications uh, for thinking about how the brain does stuff, whether that kind of uh, implication is something that should feed into uh, questions about what psychology is doing or not. I think uh, it's an interesting question, but not, not one I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to take for granted that what the brain does is relevant to psychology. Um, so many of you are familiar with this view, uh, which I'll call the classical view, and that is that uh, the way to describe neural function is in terms of receptive fields. And so you see, uh, it, well, Hubel and Weasel were awarded the Nobel Prize for their work, and on the right is an example of one of their experiments where they uh, recorded from anesthetized cats and uh, showed cats very simple stimuli, visual stimuli of uh, moving bars and uh, other kinds of simple uh, visual stimuli, and they found that uh, in visual cortex there are cells that have certain kinds of response properties that is, they, uh, the simple cells, what they called them, uh, responded to bars of light in particular oriented directions. Uh, and the idea was that the cortex has, at least in uh, lower visual areas, a topographical mapping to visual space, and that individual neurons had sensitivity to certain uh, sort of basic visual properties uh, in that visual space, and those uh, sensitivities, the neurons that, that had those sensitivities could then be combined in a hierarchical way in order to form uh, more complex feature detector, de detectors. So um, this kind of view actually was consistent with stuff that was known from the periphery. So even in the retina, you have these sort of simple feature detectors. So uh, there are cells, retinal ganglion cells, that are classified as on and off cells. I don't know if there's a pointer, but it might be helpful to have one. Uh, so cells that have either excitatory uh, centers and inhibitory surrounds or vice versa. And then depending on what kind of simulation you give those cells, uh, you get different kinds of activity profiles that are consistent with thinking of those cells as having excitatory centers and inhibitory surrounds or vice versa. Um, and so on the right of this slide, you can see how the cellular firing, thank you, that's great, is dependent on uh, um, all right, so there we go. Okay, 
Uh, so here are the pluses, uh, excitatory center, the, the blue area is the inhibitory surround. If you put a small dot in that center, you get firing. Uh, if you put a big dot in that center, you get even increased firing. If you put the small dot in the inhibitory surround, you get a little bit diminished firing. So that's during, the dot is presented during this line. Uh, if, you in, if you illuminate the inhibitory surround, you get very decreased firing um, and something kind of in the middle if you illuminate both. And so there's sort of a logic of construction of visual cortical function. So you go all the way from the periphery to uh, V1. So you've got the retina, you've got uh, combinations of those computational units in LGN. You get bigger combinations that are uh, simple cells in visual cortex, and then you get more complex combinations um, in terms of complex cells and hypercomplex cells. And all of this fit very nicely with the idea that the cells were really acting as feature detectors. And uh, a generalization of that idea is that as you go up the cortical hierarchy, you get more and more complex feature detectors. And that's what our brain is doing. It's sort of detecting features in the outside world. And, uh, and then it was also discovered that there are parts of the brain that seem sensitive to different kinds of features. So area um, V4 is sensitive to color. Uh, area MT is sensitive to motion. And it's sensitive to motion in an interesting way. It's actually sensitive to global field motion. So uh, cells lower down in the hierarchy that have smaller receptive fields are subject to what you might think of as the barber pole illusion. So if you think about the turning barber pole, it looks like uh, the stripes are actually moving up and down, but in fact, uh, they're staying in the same place. And what you're getting is a signal that's uh, from a very restricted area. Uh, and what you see is the motion as if it's going perpendicular to the, the surface here, but uh, the actual motion is going in this direction. And what MT is able to do is pool information from lots of little uh, sort of pinhole views in order to give you a percept of global motion. Um, beyond IT, uh, beyond MT are other areas that also are sensitive to, vis to some kind of visual feature. And it was discovered that uh, area IT or infratemporal cortex um, is sensitive, cells seem to be sensitive to complex features and complex features that are actually invariant to various kinds of transformations like rotation. Uh, and so this is an example of a cell from IT. And then uh, there, the, the grand uh, generalization to this might lead you to a hypothesis like the grandmother cell hypothesis, the idea that there's going to be individual cells in your brain that are specifically feature detectors of individual you know, any individual that you could identify. So there's going to be a grandmother cell in your brain that will detect your grandmother. And uh, in fact, in uh, hippocampus, recordings were done that suggested that maybe this wasn't a crazy idea. Um, so there was a, a Jennifer Aniston cell that responded uh, to pictures of Jennifer Aniston and not to pictures of lots of other people. Um, and interestingly, they uh, they also report that this cell did not respond to pictures of Jennifer Aniston. And, and notice that these pictures, she's, you know, different poses, different angles, all of that. It still re responded to Jennifer Aniston, but it did not respond to Jennifer Aniston in the company of B Brad Pitt. Uh, so that was interesting. And the thought was uh, maybe it's not a Jennifer Anis Aniston cell, but rather a. Um, Rachel on fri in friend cell. <laughs> so there's contextual information that's modulating the response properties of the cell. Uh, and you might think that, that rather than being cells for individuals, they might be cells for certain kinds of concepts or complicated um, meaning related cells. Um, so to sort of sum up the classical view, uh, the idea is that neurons represent specific properties in the world in virtue of being selectively active when they're, when they're provided with the relevant input. Um, notice that this is really a bottom-up view, that, that what they're representing, uh, or in order to determine what they're representing, you have to sort of look at what the information is that's feeding up from the bottom. 
And notice also that there are certain problems in extending this view to the brain across the board. Uh, a bottom-up view is not going to be particularly helpful when you get to things like executive function. Um, at least it's going to be very difficult to determine what the representational capacity uh, or function of a cell is. Um, but even motor function it doesn't seem like a receptive field is the way to do it. You have to talk about then what uh, neural activation maps, how neural activation maps to particular motor movements. Um, so th there are challenges in, in taking the classical view uh, to represent neural coding throughout the brain. Um, another way of thinking about it is that a function of, the, of a particular cell is to represent the property that it computes in the larger system. But again, in this classical view, the computation is really a bottom-up kind of computation. Um, and uh, I'm just going to flag right now that uh, there's, a, there's reason to think that the information you get from neuroimaging experiments and the information you get from single unit recording might not give you the same kind of information. And when, when people report neuroimaging experiments, they're really talking about above baseline firing compared to some kind of uh, contrast task. Um, so this will, this will become relevant later. Um, so aside from the problem of uh, sort of neatly mapping this kind of receptive field view across the cortex uh, all the way up the hierarchy uh, and back down to motor representation. Uh, a couple other things were, were discovered or highlighted um, in the course of, let's say, the last 20 years of, of neuroscience and cognitive science. Um, and one of them is that the way that we actually assign representational function to cells might not be correct, um, in part because we seem to be biasing certain kinds of bottom-up properties. Uh, so, for instance, Lecky and Sanofsky um, did, com built a uh, neural network model whose function was to give an output that told the, uh, that, that indicated what the shape, uh, sorry, uh, yes, indicated what the shape was that it was being presented. So it was being presented visual arrays um, that basically encoded information about the uh, light and shadow on a particular uh, three-dimensional shape given a certain kind of illumination. And the cool thing about, or one cool thing about this network is that when you looked at the hidden layers and thought, you know, what are these things doing, what you saw were things that looked like receptive field properties that were very similar to the kinds of receptive field properties that were seen uh, in early visual cortex. And so th this showed that you could get something like uh, a neural architecture out of using just back propagation in a neural network. Very cool. Uh, but if you just you know, recorded from these cells, you might think, hey, well, the function of these cells is uh, to be edge detectors. Uh, interestingly, though, none of the data that this network ever saw had edges. And the function of those cells really was to compute uh, curvature, not edges. And so it raised the possibility, or at least uh, highlighted the possibility, that the way that we attribute function by showing uh, animals' cells recording from a tiny piece of that big system uh, and then trying to correlate what our stimulus is with the response properties might not give us the true functional nature of what's going on. And they suggested that one of the things that you need to pay attention to beyond just the receptive field of the cell is also the projective field, which is where are those neurons that you're recording from projecting to, and what are the functions of those neurons? That is, what are those neurons trying to indicate? And so um, it's not really surprising, because if you have any kind of functionalist view of the mind, the function is identified not just by the input, by, but by the input-output relationship. So what they're basically saying is you can't just pay attention to the input. You've got to pay attention to the output, too. It gets really hard with the brain when you don't have any independent access to what the output is doing except as input to the next layer. So um, this is just to highlight a big problem in, in trying to understand the brain, which is the further you get from the periphery, whether it's sensory or motor, the harder it is to figure out how to assign semantic meaning or function to uh, the cells involved. Uh, the second problem 
um, you know, if we could actually explain everything, I guess it would be a problem that we could just sweep under the rug. But the brain has massive back connections, and the classical picture is really a feed-forward picture. Uh, and so that leaves mysterious why it is that we have as many or maybe more uh, backward connections between cor cortical areas and within cortical areas um, than we have feed-forward connections. So what is, what's all that for? Evolution doesn't usually waste a whole lot of resources on stuff that does no good. Um, so that was uh, kind of just hanging out there in the background, but recently um, a new theory of what the brain is doing has been advanced uh, that actually seems to deal pretty well with these kinds of problems. Um, and this is called predictive coding. Um, there are some really interesting philosophical books on that. There are some really difficult uh, scientific papers on it, but I urge you to take a look if you haven't already looked at the theory. Um, I'm going to give you the basic sketch and then try to motivate a little bit why it's an exciting theory, because it really does uh, help explain a whole bunch of data about brain function that, uh, at, at a variety of levels that you might have, have thought not expl explicable by the very same kinds of story or mechanism. Um, okay, so the idea in predictive coding is that the brain is a series of networks uh, arranged in a hierarchical fashion, uh, and that those networks have a standard architecture and function such that the projections back from any layer in the network to the layer that feeds into it actually carries a predictive or generative model of what's going on. And the forward projections actually carry the error signal. So just with that, it's kind of a dramatic uh, inversion of the way in which people had been thinking about brain coding where the feed for the model uh, is really carried by the feed-forward projections, not the back projections. So it seemed like the, the idea is the brain is doing something very different than the conception that Hubel and Weasel had. Um, so th this is the basic package, uh, but another important part is that the error signal can vary depending on the context, um, and the gain on the error signal is related to the, estim the estimates of precision of information from the top, the higher levels. So uh, things like the salience and reliability of the signal coming in is going to modulate the uh, amount of error that gets um, paid attention to by the network. And the idea is that these hierarchical networks basically relax in order to minimize the, the error across multiple levels. Um, now, all of that is dependent upon the context or the priors that are encoded in these generative models. And so you can get differential activity depending on uh, the prior expectations of, the, of these networks. Uh, and the, the goal of the brain then, in other words, is to predict its next state and to minimize, to, to do whatever changes. So le learning in this case is basically updating the weights in order for that predict prediction of the future state to, to be better the next time around. Any questions about the basic theory? OK. So, um, so there are different ways to think about how this general model goes, depending on what exactly you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about perception, uh, the brain is trying to predict its ne next state. Uh, and the current perception or belief that you have is involved in generating the predictions of the next state. Um, and the bottom-up information, that is the perceptual evidence, is coming uh, up and comparing. You get, you get comparison of the incoming evidence from the world with your prediction, and you update your models if the world evidence is, going, is uh, different from your model suggestion. Um, but whether you update it also depends on whether you think the information coming from the world is information that you have good reason to believe is true or good information. So in a very noisy environment, you may not update your model. And in an a environment where you have you know, good lighting and you're attending to the thing that you're looking at, you might think the information I'm getting from the bottom up is better than uh, if it conflicts with the top-down information, 
it'll take priority over that. Um, the way to think about it in terms of action, and this is something that I'm uh, still struggling to, to really grasp uh, in its totality, is that what the brain does is it models the state that it wants to uh, be in at the end of an action, and the process of error minimization informs uh, the way the brain calculates trajectories to reach that final goal. And so moving is actually a process of minimizing the error between your current state and your goal state. Okay. So here's a, a little diagram just to sort of help think about the way things work. So you get input from the periphery, um, you get predictions that are coming from the top down, and you get unpredicted input feeding forward uh, up the hierarchy and the brain settles into a state of error global error minimization. Um, that's the nice way of looking at it. This is a picture from Andy Clark's just released book on this, which I recommend. Uh, this is a, another way of looking at it for those of you who are more mathematically inclined. Uh, and Carl Friston has an entire mathematical formalism that's supposed to um, embody these kind of general principles. Um, so uh, the question is if, so this is just a, a theoretical uh, posit. This is you know, an idea or a theory about how the brain works. So what, what should we expect to see um, if we look at the brain? Well, for one thing, hierarchical coding, uh, predictive signals, error pro propagation. Um, and then uh, I would like to say, what you might expect to see might differ depending on exactly how you're looking. So if you're looking uh, with fMRI using bold signals, uh, those seem to be dominated by local field potentials. Um, and the local field potentials seem to be more associated with uh, apical dendrite uh, activity, which would, be, would correspond in this model to error prediction than actual model driving. So, uh, but if you're recording from uh, let's say layer five in cortex, you might actually see activity more related to the generative model than to the predictive errors. Um, so in a little bit more detail uh, on this view, since back projections carry prediction, uh, you would see uh, spiking activity that would be involved with at any layer of the hierarchy representing the generative model in that in that level. Um, and the bold effect, since it's related to the LFP, uh, would be uh, concentrated in the region in which the axons of the model terminate. Uh, so in fact, that would be not congruent with the generative model at that same area. It would be one level down. Uh, the error signal uh, would be generated locally, so that's supposed to be part of the uh, computation of the dendrites in an area. Uh, and so that bold signal would most likely be maximally correlated with the error signal. Uh, and you would also see differences in the level of the error, error signal depending on the salience uh, and reliability of the information. And so in cases in which uh, subject was attending to that part of, uh, let's say, visual space, if it's a vis visual task, you would tend to see elevated levels of activity uh, because the error signal would be increased because the g gain would be increased. Is that all clear-ish? Um, so here's just uh, different ways of graphically representing it. Uh, so essentially you get uh, inputs into uh, the granular layer um, around level, level four or so, you get transmission to apical dendrites uh, and the multiplexing of the uh, incoming signal and the descending predictions from the higher areas is done here. And you would get uh, the errors pro projecting from here to the next higher level. Um, and then you would also get part of the generative model uh, being computed in these lower le levels uh, and the descending predictions 
to lower areas from the basal dendrites. Um, and this is a, another Bastos et al. Uh, generated uh, a less biologically looking but similar computationally model of what the can canonical microcircuit of predicted coding would be. Um, and then if you sort of zoom out and you look at the hierarchy, you would see that there would be interconnections but at the periphery um, between different levels of, let's say, audition and vision and proprioception. Uh, but all of these models would be linked by generative models that take into account multimodal information. And they might even be linked to an even higher level, more abstract model that is related to the, the general concept itself. Uh, and so representation of anything for which we have lots of uh, con context and uh, associated information is going to involve a cascade of activity from very high levels all the way down to very low levels as each level models the part of the space that, that it represents. Um, OK. So I just uh, I, I want to consider some applications or ways in which this kind of general framework has been used to explain data from neuroscience. Uh, so at the very low level, you get uh, elements of the receptive field properties being predicted uh, by these generative models. And so th this is actually just a, um, a computational model, again, like Lecky and Sanowski, that shows that you get um, receptive field properties that are very like things like uh, hypercomplex cells falling out of a network that's trained uh, with this kind of uh, predictive coding method or model. Uh, and as an example, um, so Hubel and Weasel identified end-stop neurons, neurons that uh, they respond to oriented bars within the receptive field. But if those bars actually extend beyond the receptive field, uh, the, the response of the cell is decreased. And this is quite naturally explained by predictive coding um, because in the tuning up of the network, that is in visual experience, if you see a line, it's more likely to be a line that extends through space beyond the elements or the bounds of a V1 receptive field, which is rel relatively confined. Um, and so the general expectation is if there's a line in part of the visual field, there will be lines in contiguous parts of the visual field too. And so uh, what you get here uh, if you have a receptive field um, that uh, you have a line that's confined to the receptive field and doesn't get extend beyond that, so it uh, doesn't extend into the what's called now non-classical receptive field, uh, then you get a lot of activity because in essence you get a top-down model saying, I predict that there's going to be stimulus in this box and in this box, and there's no stimulus, so there's an error signal that's sent up, and that's the activity that you see uh, when you record from that area. Uh, whereas if you extended that stimulus so that it, it uh, illuminates all parts of that non-classical receptive field, uh, you get decreased error signal and decreased activity. Um, so that and similar kinds of low-level visual field properties are nicely predicted. Uh, but so are really high-level things like visual experience of uh, binocular rivalry. So if you send, uh, if you give somebody a visual stimulus in two different visual stimuli, one in each eye, rather than experiencing them as a fusion of two different stimulus, stimuli, such as in this case a face and a, um, and a uh, house, you, uh, you tend to get a percept that alternates between one and the other. That is, you get a, a globally coherent percept. OK. Um, <laughs> I'll try to go faster. Uh, you get a globally coherent percept. And what's happening, the idea is uh, that, that as your experience is of, uh, let's say, a face, your top-down prediction is that there's a face here, there's a face here. Uh, but then there's a growing error signal because it's not matching the low-level input. And eventually, that growing error signal from the low-level overwhelms the high-level prediction of a face. Uh, 
until you switch your uh, visual experience to that of the house. And then you're, you start predicting that there's going to be a house there, but then you've got this conflicting information from the face. And so you get this alternation back and forth of face and house. Um, there have been some clever functional MRI experiments that have uh, asked what happens if you're shown visual scenes that have certain kind of statistical properties um, and, you're, and part of the scene is omitted. And it turns out that, uh, sorry, I forgot to enclose or include the um, reference, but this is a paper by Lars Mookley. Uh, if you're shown something and part of it is missing, uh, you can get, you can take multi-voxel pattern analysis on the fMRI data <coughs> from the area that is not being stimulated by anything and recover the, the statistical profile of that picture and predict that it's that picture that they're seeing uh, from the, the data confined to here, which is what you would expect if there's a global prediction of what is going on there um, coming from the top down. Uh, and then this goes even to psychiatry. So one way that you might be able to explain delusions is to say that the prediction error is misweighted uh, in cases of delusion. So if you have uh, inputs that are, let's say, just from noise or something, um, or you have some false beliefs, you will generate a prediction error. And if you, instead of updating uh, your low-level beliefs, you update your high-level beliefs uh, to reduce the error, uh, then you end up generating more prediction error, which causes you to update the wrong level of belief. So rather than bringing your prediction into uh, um, register with what the world is saying, you're basically bringing the world into register with your uh, mistaken predictions. And so uh, that vicious circle is what allows uh, or at least what explains uh, delusions that seem to be completely out of touch with reality. And, you know, people just start to see what they expect to see in some sense. Um, the, the theory also makes some low-level predictions about what kinds of dynamical things you should see in the cortex. So uh, for one thing, uh, you would expect to see error signal accumulating and being fed forward at higher frequencies than changes in the model, which would be at lower frequencies. And you do see uh, that the um, laminar distribution of um, activity across layers of the cortex corresponds to that, that you get high, high frequency uh, information in the spectra at the apical dendrites and low frequency information in the feedback projections. OK. So all of this, uh, what do we make of it? Um, so my, my question in starting to think about this is, like, if this theory is true, does it tell us anything about the way we should think about these problems of cognitive ontology? And in some ways, you think, well, it's got to, because the whole function of the brain is, in a sense, reconceptualized, although lots of people are thinking in terms of prediction these days, and, and Kristen's uh, one of them. So this is not, I think, very far off from the way a lot of people are approaching their work these days. Um, now, some people have mistakenly thought that perfect prediction would just predict. Uh, so if the, aim, if the aim of the brain is predict its, its next state, uh, then what it really should aim for is stasis. And perfect prediction would involve no activity whatsoever. But I, don't think th I think that's a mistaken conclusion from the theory. I think that uh, what you would get is activity but, all, but a perfect predictor would have uh, feedback activity. In fact, there would be no reason to even consult the world if you were perfectly good. You could just run forward your high-level model. Uh, but you still have to have this high-level model, and it would create activity at all levels of the hierarchy. It's just that the activity would be all feedback. Um, and so uh, really, you should just look for uh, perfect pred prediction would involve no feed-forward activity. Um, one of the things that is different about this model of brain function is that the models themselves aren't these static models. Uh, it's not that what, what we're predicting or computing is some kind of static view, but rather we're predicting a generative model that's very context dependent. And the way in which the model 
itself sends information back uh, and makes its predictions is itself statistical and context dependent. Um, and we do see lots of effects of context dependent and brain dependence and brain activity, um, but that itself is, I think, a little bit too vague to, to make too much of at this point. Um, let me go on. Um, so more specifically, if you look at, at neural activity in particular uh, brain regions, what should, how should you interpret those? Um, I would love help if people think that I'm ma making the wrong conclusions or drawing the wrong conclusions from this. Um, but it seems like what the, the model entails is that, that pick some area or level of the hierarchy in your brain, level X, um, what you should see is a combination of model activity at level X and uh, the mismatch between the level X and level X plus one predictions. Um, and uh, so the superficial layer in particular represents that difference between the model prediction um, at X plus one and the bottom up responses, which are going to be at, at least in, in terms of anything that's going to be inf uh, informed by uh, perception, it's going to be driven by the input signals. Um, and the deep levers, levels represent the model-driven information, which may not be stimulus-bound. Uh, so those predictions don't have to necessarily uh, depend on the stimulus at all. Um, and the bold signal, as I suggested, is going to preferentially reflect the error signal and not the model signal. Um, if, the, if it's true that the local field potential is mostly uh, a reflection of the error signal. Uh, and actually figuring out exactly what we're looking at, are we looking at error or are we looking at uh, model, might require that we could actually differentiate between where in the cortical mantle those signals are coming from. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, this is a little harder. So. Uh, in the classical view, the idea is that what the brain is doing is building up a bottom-up model of the state of the world. Uh, and you might, if you're thinking about it in terms of semantics, you might think that really what, it, what the semantical theory that fits is some sort of indicator semantics. Um, so what the brain is indicating is whatever it just saw, the immediate past state of the world. Um, and the predictive coding theory suggests instead that what it's indicating, it, that it, well, first of all, indication may not be the right kind of word, that what the brain is doing is forming a hypothesis, um, but not really what the past state of the world is, but in fact about what the future state of the world is conditioned by what the past states it has seen have been. Um, and if you then think about what that would mean in terms of looking at individual levels of the hierarchy, I think it might depend on exactly what sort of thing you're looking at. So if you're looking at visual processing and let's say categorization or something like that, uh, you might think that the representational hierarchy of objects, um, it, it wouldn't need to correspond to what we think of as the semantically transparent levels like you know, Labrador, dog, animal, et cetera. Um, but it may in fact be the case that the reasons that we fixate on those levels pretty naturally is because that is in fact what the salient predictive uh, hierarchical elements are. So that, that the semantically transparent levels might in fact correspond pretty nicely. Um, that uh, the, the way we taxonomize the world around us, at least in terms of objects and their relationships, uh, may be exactly the most efficient predictive way of doing things. Um, but when we're thinking more broadly, not just of how do we represent objects, but what kind of functions does the brain perform, then I think it's a lot harder to say. Um, because really what the function is, is uh, generating a model that's predictive of the next state. And that could be, uh, that could, that could uh, turn out to be really different depending on what the connections are between the previous state and the next state in that particular branch of this hierarchy. Um, and so feature placing, you know, what we say, uh, uh, for instance, the V4 computes color, MT computes motion. There's lots of evidence that there's a lot of color information elsewhere. There's a lot of motion information elsewhere. 
and it may be hard to actually use these kind of feature placing functional terms in a way that maps onto what the brain is trying to do. Um, there, I think there's an interesting question of whether uh, there's going to be some sort of top level. So Jacob Howey uh, at least theorizes that the top node of this hierarchy is the prediction of the way the world is. You know, the winning statistical prediction is what our conscious experience is. Uh, and if that's true, then there probably will be some up, upper level system that at least has, uh, might be identifiable that will of course then feed back to all these other systems so you would get activity all through the system, but you might be able to, to uh, associate activity in some high level with uh, conscious experience. But I'm not sure I'm gonna buy that level uh, of the predictions about the predictive coding models. Um, anyway, so these are just my thoughts about how, these, how the predictive coding view might affect the way we think about uh, cognitive ontology. Um, it, I think we don't have to give up notions about representational and representation and functional specificity. I think that those kinds of notions fit very nicely with predictive coding as they do with the classical view. Um, Interestingly, re accurate representation might actually be signaled by less activity than inaccurate representation, which is not part of the classical view. You know, in the classical view, you would expect maximal activity when the stimulus is spot on with what the prediction is. Um, if you're trying to sort of parcel out what the representational uh, content is of areas, it looks like you're not going to be able to easily do that with remaining in one hierarchical level because uh, information from the predictive model is going to feed back to a lower level, which will contain information about the error. And so the representational elements might actually be distributed. Um, and that might be a complicating factor in trying to, to piece apart what these models or what these different levels are doing. Um, and one suggestion is that, uh, I would say not rather than doing neuroscience, but in conjunction with doing neuroscience, the best way of trying to, to maybe get a handle on what the semantics or the functional specificities are uh, would be by actually uh, trying to build computational models using deep learning networks, which uh, this is not my area of expertise, but I understand that the deep learning networks um, are uh, very good for implementing this kind of hierarchical gener generative model systems. and so. Maybe we could understand more by trying to reverse engineer those networks than just by uh, poking cells in the brain and, and correlating them with stimuli. Um, and so that's what I have, and I would love your input. So we've got 15 minutes for questions. We got a, a comment and a question. Um, one comment, actually, I, I quite like this framework, and um, I was actually in the other London last week um, with uh, Kristen's group looking at models of um, schizophrenia, for example, and auditory hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And in that one, they have a, uh, the model actually uh, suggests that there's a misattribution of the top-down signal um, that actually goes back to auditory cortex and makes it, treat it, 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 it treats the signal as if it's actually a, a percept resulting in a hallucination as opposed to knowing that it's actually not a percept, it's, it's sort of the intrinsic activity of auditory cortex. Yeah. So the way that these things can get messed up is where does the, the top-down influence happen? Does it happen at the immediate level or does it actually skip one level, for example, and that results in a, in a dysfunction um, in the system. It feels a sort of slightly bigger yeah. model than what you're talking about. It's the same idea as you have with delusion, for instance. So you're saying that, that uh, feedback connections need be purely to the next lower level down, but they right, could they be could direct. The and there's there's yeah. an anatomy to suggest that's also, that's also true. Right, right. No, that, that is true, although um, you could get the very same uh, result, I believe, just by a story about the, the gain on the error. Mm -hmm. um, this this so is actually a con conjunction between the um, uh, dynamic causal modeling application to fMRI data, I believe it was. Uh-huh, uh, okay. Schizophrenics, and the model, they, they came, came up with one when we're actually the feedback effect from uh, frontal cortex actually skipped STS and went directly to the pre stratus, and that was the, the empirical suggestion. Uh-huh. 
But the question I have is actually um, more to do with, uh, there's, this is obviously a very popular topic right now across both modeling and neuroscience. And I'm having difficulty is actually understanding where it's not working very well. So are there challenges for this, this perspective that <coughs> make it seem like there's something more that that's, that's not really explainable by just pure predictive coding? Um, I think that's a great question, and I'm really interested in the answer, and I'm not going to be able to give you a definitive <laughs> one. Um, there, so uh, there are things that I don't know how to explain with this model, um, but so far I haven't seen data that I think is not consistent with this model. Um, the, th the kind of thing that I don't know how to explain is stuff like uh, executive function and decision making where it doesn't seem like there's an e it seems like there's no higher level. I mean, the whole point is to figure out what the higher level is supposed to be, not uh, form a prediction that then has to be matched by the, by the bottom up stuff. So um, I haven't thought about it enough, but but a lot a lot of things that we think of as central to agency don't sit f very nicely with this, as far as I can tell. Um, but that's something I'm interested in thinking about more. Uh, but I haven't seen data from neuroscience that that just doesn't fit with this model. Um, and whether that means that, that could either be evidence that this is a really good model or that it's such a general empty model, you know, that, that, that it's not falsifiable because it's not making any strong enough predictions. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so in the neural network literature, there's sort of a formalism that you can apply in order to calculate the level at which something you know, should be placed in, for purposes of analysis. Uh, and uh, maybe <laughs> that can be nicely deployed. I think at this point, really what, well, the, the, the first level constraint is going to be the anatomy of the system, which um, is not that easy to determine anyway, uh, especially at, at high levels. And there's so much interconnectivity, it's hard to say. Um, and then you've got the question then of, of the anatomical connections, which ones are actually functionally doing anything. Um, and I think what I would say is that, you know, given anatomical constraints, then if you had functional information and then you applied the formalism, you might be able to say, you know, there's a path, this is path length of, you know, 17 uh, in this kind of functional network. And so then it's between 16 and, and 18. Uh, but it seems to me that, that we'd, we'd need a lot more fine-grained information about the connectome than we even have in order to answer that for any particular cell. Uh, but we do have, at least in you know, early sensory areas, you know, sort of a schematic view of how things are connected that will allow us to make these kinds of uh, distinctions. But higher up, it's harder to say. Can I just jump in? Because uh, from an engineering perspective, when we build these systems robotically, the levels are pretty clear when you start at the low. So you've got forces, kinematics, configuration space. These are all separated by like the first derivative, okay? So it's very natural that in sensory motor, uh, control of sensory motor systems that 
the levels can be identified. But as soon as you start to get up to a level where you have to avoid an object or plan spatially or temporally, that you're moving up levels where it's not clear what, what we mean by the first derivative as you go up. So in other words, the metric space breaks down and yeah. you're at this stage where it's now looking like you're moving towards symbolic uh, reasoning. In which case, the question then becomes, what do we mean? What do we mean by a difference when something is specified in terms of a logic? And, and so that I think is the challenge: is as, a, as we're moving up towards explanations of cognition, that the, the control theoretic metaphors start to break down, and, and we need to think about uh, sy symbols or logical reasoning. And that, that's what becomes challenging because yeah. then you're no longer able to point to a neuron and say, do you compute a function, but are you part of an ensemble that's reasoning? Right. I'm not sure we're, we may be talking a little past each other on this point because the, so when you're saying level, you're talking about sort of a computational level of, uh, you know, if you're going to give a computational description of what's going on at that level, you're doing it in terms of derivatives. And then we don't have a nice computational description and I think that, that at least I'm not sure, but my, in, my interpretation of the question was that it was actually a more architectural question um, that you might think might precede the functional question if you're trying to dis assign function to a, a level. Um, well, I, I guess what I'm saying is that you, you can find a one-to-one -one mapping at the low levels. But, right. But as you move up <laughs> towards cognition, then, then that right. the game, you, you, you don't have that mapping. Right. So, no. uh, I'm, are we I'm taking deferring fingers to or are we going questions? Got quite a few questions. Oh, um, so, next is yep. there. Uh, <coughs> that was very nice. Thank you. I have a question about how do you understand a prior? Uh, so, when I read Clark or Howey, and also when I read Princeton, I see two different kinds of high hand waving answers to that question. Yeah. Uh, Parks and how it is like, well, brain somehow stores these priors and it's a philosophical hand waving. And Princeton is a mathematical hand waving. So he, <laughs> he gives you, uh, he said, well, of course, the, a prior is a multipl multiplicative product over a function that presumably integrates over a period of time. But none of those things seem to be, to be satisfactory answers to what is exactly what the brain is storing when it stores a prior. So yep. um, are neurons storing? Gaussian distributions over previous frequencies of encounters? Because if that is so, that really radically changes our views of what specific neurons are doing. Yeah. Uh, and it would force me, presumably, to think down to uh, early results in, say, long-term potentiation, in which I don't have cell assemblies, but I'm just looking at very specific. How do I make sense of exactly what the neuron is doing if I, I'm trying to understand what is it for a neuron to accumulate a prior? Or, um, so, so my question is, what, what do you think a prior is? A prior? Uh, so that, that is, I think, the one, the one question I would most like to have an answer to with regard to this. <laughs> um, I know that some people have argued that really what we're talking are population codes, and that you get, that, that somehow the population itself st stores a probability density, density function, how that's, actually implemented, I have no idea. Um, and I'm not sure that that's any more satisfying than just saying a neuron stores of, uh, without some kind of implementational <coughs> details about how that <coughs> is the case or, or how it effectively works as a probability density function. I don't know, but I know that's the line. Yeah. And, uh, and I would like to know the answer to your question. If anyone else has. So we've got quite a few questions. Um, maybe I'll challenge people to ask them as quickly as possible, and we'll try to get through as many as we can in the next five minutes. So next is Mike. Yeah, let me just push a little yes, bit. Mike. You say we get to keep functional specificity. What's that? You say up here we get to keep functional specificity in this uh, model. Yeah. What I'm kind of functional specificity do we get to keep? Uh, probably yeah. there are domains, presumably, of different kinds of prediction. Yeah. But after that, it doesn't look to me like the prediction breaks down the way we normally think of functions breaking down into subfunctions and so on. So do you have thoughts on what kind of specificity we, we So have? I think 
Um, we may not be able to give a generalized description of specificity, but for instance, I think that we can, you know, we can say it doesn't. It doesn't seem wrong to say that uh, this cell is essentially recording. It is a, a you know, Gaussian filter or something like that, and uh, this cell is an n-stopped cell for computational purposes. Uh, at some higher level, it might get very hard to, to say what those functions are, but I think we're, the classical view has that problem as well, right? It's some kind of multiplexing of the lower <coughs> level stuff. Um, but at least you know, close to the periphery, I don't think it's wrong to say that this, this cell uh, acts as a, as a Gaussian filter or this cell acts as an um, on-centered cell. And, uh, and then it also looks like there are cells that are recording, you know, that are, are uh, their function is to uh, represent, you know, faces at 90 degrees or, you know, faces on an, at an angle or profiles or, um, because it still, it still seems to, to effectively capture the firing patterns of the cells, right? Yeah, I'm um, not sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Mel and Dante. Early on, you talk. I let you talk. Early on, you um, uh, talked about uh, taking into account the output systems that uh, these networks might serve, and that might be some way into functional specificity in the sense that, um, uh, in a, in a commentary I wrote on Andy Clark's thing for BBS, I pointed out there were some areas where it looks like priors in one domain are, are much more resistant than uh, priors in another. So, for example. Uh, in the size weight illusion, where a small object uh, is made to be the same weight as a very large object, and you, uh, no matter, and you can do this for a long time, you can pick up that small one, and you just don't integrate the information. You go on thinking, God damn, that thing is really heavy. Yeah. But you, your motor system adjusts uh, almost uh, immediately. Within two or three trials, you've used uh, some information, um, presumably from feedback about uh, the nature of the experience you're having to readjust now your graphs when you move forward. And you can show that, I mean, Randy Flanagan, not Randy McIntosh, Randy Flanagan uh, has, has shown that when you create toy worlds, for example, where you have like all small objects are heavy and all big objects are large, uh, you, you, your, your perception of all of that takes uh, a lot to, uh, to come aboard, whereas your motor system adapts to it right away. So I, I wonder whether or not um, there's uh, an emphasis, uh, a greater emphasis on the on, on the consumers uh, of uh, the information might lead you to understand something more about the way the mm. systems are organized. Right. So because the priors are coming from the top down, so that's the yeah. that's essentially the projective field, and so if the priors are resistant to updating, that gives you uh, a clue about what their function. Exactly, yes. and of course, okay. it would be, it really would be a, dumb, a dumb thing to have a system which, when you experience the size weight illusion, you do, you suddenly readjust your whole world view and, and expect small objects uh, to be heavy. That would not be a, a right. satisfactory solution to the problem. Whereas the motor system, it's important you do that in that particular uh, exam exemplar. Right. right. No, that's really interesting. Yeah. I think the last question. Sorry, did, you, did I butt in on you there? Me? No. 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 Okay, good. No. Um, last question then from Dan. Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, I've got a really long running confusion about how this is supposed to work. Uh, so I'm just going to lay it on you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I don't understand how specific predictions are supposed to work once we admit the hierarchical levels or encoding thing, different things or things at different levels of abstraction. Mm -hmm. So so one story about uh, uh, the feed forward sweep is that what happens in the feed forward sweep that we encode really low frequency spatial information and we perceive just threat. And one of the roles for top-down feedback is to bias the uh, uh, more high frequency spatial perceptions based on the overall gist. So if you, uh, so this is like some motion bars work, if you uh, 
if the general scene is like a kitchen and, and there's a blurry implement, it's going to look more like a kitchen shears. Whereas the, if the general scene is like a workshop, it's going to look more like a wrench or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to interpret this in terms of exploitation, right? Because the pi, the gist is encoding just low frequency content, right? It, it, how is it going to make a prediction about the high frequency content that there's a specific shape of a wrench here, right? Yeah. Given that X hypothesis, it just doesn't have high frequency, high frequency spatial content. Uh, I think it's the, the, the missing link is the hierarchical nature. So um, once, if you have the top down workshop information, then it's going to bias at a level of slightly higher frequency um, a bunch of possibilities that are consistent with the workshop thing. And then that itself is going to feed down to a lower level. And eventually, the, it'll feed down to, the, to the, the lowest level where the wrench will be differentiated from the spatula. Um, so at, so you can think of each of these, le these levels are nested and they're only kind of, try they're, they're trying to accommodate within their own local circuit, uh, but each of those feeds to the next level down. Sure, but, but biasing a lot of possibilities as far as I can understand it is not the same as making a specific prediction against which an occurring per can produce an error signal. Uh, Maybe I don't understand the, so the question. So, understand the matching so, so if I'm if I'm in the workshop mode, then a bunch of things will be potentiated at a lower level, like uh, you know wrench, screwdriver, hammer, etc. And at the lowest level, there's going to be information coming in that's uh, more consistent with hammer than with scr screwdriver. Right, and so, so there's going to be sort of a mutual settling in of, uh, I don't know what I just said, hammer, you know, <laughs> hammer workshop, da da da, all those things fit together um, at the multiple levels. So it's not that you get from the top uh, hammer; it's that you get workshop-like stuff with, you know, general tool like dimensions and then but from the bottom you've got information that's consi more consistent with hammer than with screwdriver. Does that does that help? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, you know, it's a theory as they say. Uh, <laughs> um, is that all the time we have? Yeah, or? I think that's all the time we have. Okay. I'm sure we can continue it in the coffee break. Okay. So do we want to say 15 minutes from now? Or we sure. Yeah. Well, sure. Or, or if we can just because we'll I get a 10-minute coffee break. Yeah, let's make it. Okay, so if everybody can try to be back in 10 minutes. Thank you.